We're happy to have Niao He. She's um, a professor at the ATH University in Zurich. And she's leading the um, optimization and decision intelligence group. And in her work, she's uh, involved like in many um, areas of machine learning, but mainly from the optimization theory perspective. So showing vertical grounds and properties of algorithms for the stochastic optimization problem. Um, these techniques will apply to reinforcement learning and policy gradient in particular, where some of our latest work also um, involve. So please, let's welcome together now. All right. Thanks for the introduction. And uh, it's really great pleasure to be here. And for this lecture, uh, as introduced, I will discuss about uh, uh, policy gradient methods. And as mentioned, I think th this is also a topic that's more close to my heart and also a topic that has received tremendous, very exciting progress, both in practice and in theory. And uh, of course, it's hard to imagine how you can you know, cover such a big topic in just one and a half hours. Uh, I'll try my best to give you a kind of both a treatment of the basics of policy gradient methods and a bit of high level ideas of what's going on in the, in the research directions, more about the theoretical guarantees. Okay. So here's basically an outline of the, uh, the, the lecture for today. And uh, uh, I think you already have uh, uh, learned a bit about policy gradient methods from, I think, the Monday lecture by Olivia. And uh, here we'll go a bit, dive a bit more into the details of what are the specific algorithms and, uh, and the results. All right. To start with, I think uh, you already all know by now that reinforcement learning is all about agents trying to learn to optimally act in an unknown environment. And oftentimes we say an agent's behavior is usually described by policy pi, which is a mapping from state to the action space or the distribution over your action space. And the model or the environment is actually defined usually by the model, right? This captures both the transition dynamics p and also the reward function R, right? These are oftentimes unknown in real world. And at each round, right, the agent uh, observes some state from the environment, and then it plays some action A according to the behavior strategy pi, right, policy pi here. And then the environment will return some uh, reward signals RT to the agent, and the agent also, and the, the environment also tran transit to a new state ST plus one following this transition dynamics P, right? And the goal, we know that here we can define the cumulative, expected cumulative reward as the value function V pi, right? For a given state S, initial state S, and the policy pi, right? This here particularly, I'm looking at the infinite horizon setting where we consider this discount factor gamma in between zero and one, because we know that from an economic perspective, usually humans favor more intermediate reward rather than a delayed reward. Right? The goal here oftentimes is really trying to maximize uh, overall choices, feasible policies pi that maximize this value function v pi, right? So these are really the key three elements of reinforcement learning, right? The policy, the, the, uh, the model, and then the, the value function. And that said, uh, like most reinforcement learning algorithms can be ca characterized into these three big classes, right? The value-based methods, which directly try to learn or estimate what is the optimal value functions, V star or Q star, right? These are the uh, value functions. And then based on these optimal value functions, you can then recover what is the optimal policy, right? By taking the greedy policy based on these value functions. And there are algorithms you already have learned from yesterday, like temporal difference learning, Q learning algorithms, SARSA, et cetera, right? These are really uh, aimed to solve or to estimate these optimal value functions. On the other hand, for policy-based uh, methods, they directly try to search what is optimal policy among your policy class, right? You can search them through all kinds of algorithms based on your zero order information of your objective function or first order information of your objective function, right? These kind of are the 
typical algorithms like policy gradient methods, natural policy gradient methods, TRPL, some of these we'll discuss a bit more in detail today. And uh, of course, uh, you should uh, also notice that for value-based methods, right, these methods, I think a big advantage of them is that they can easily leverage these Bellman properties or Markovian properties to to use temporal difference to estimate your value functions effectively, in the sense that uh, these estimators usually have much low variance. However, the downside of value-based methods is that they are usually not very scalable to large state, uh, large action spaces, right? Because uh, remember that uh, the way that we say, for example, we update Q learning algorithms is where we have to use this Bellman optimality operator, which requires you to take the best action. Of, of your next uh, state, right? If your action space is super large, right, or even if it is continuous, then this boils down to solving some nonlinear optimization problem, which can be already very challenging. So sort of policy-based methods are comes to the rescue to really scale things up to the large and potentially even continuous action spaces. However, the downside, uh, as you also have uh, learned on Monday's lecture, is that they oftentimes suffer from very high variance when you try to estimate this gradient information of your objective, and they could suffer from some sample efficiency as well due to that. So, so in this lecture, right, uh, we focus on uh, these policy-based methods, and the idea here is really that uh, we wanted to represent our policy uh, by some, uh, uh, like we want to parameterize our policy, right, with some parameter theta, and we represent the policy pi as pi theta here, right? And the goal here is we want to find the best parameter theta that maximizes uh, the, the expected long-term reward. So here's just one kind of common objective, right? We want to consider this maximizing the episodic reward, for example, and uh, we want to maximize it over all possible choice of theta, right? finding the best parameter. And uh, again, like there are many other alternative objectives you can consider, right? Instead of episodic reward, you can also look at average reward, right? So here, particularly, we're going to look at this uh, expected long-term reward uh, if your initial state S uh, follows from some initial distribution mu, and you are interested in to maximize this expectation of your value function over your initial state S. So particularly, we're going to uh, parameterize our, po our consider policies that are stochastic policies, right? So, and these are policies where we, we define pi theta as a distribution, right? For any given state S is a distribution over your action space. And there are many reasons why we are interested in stochastic policies, right? One uh, kind of more uh, convenient reason here is because uh, when we have these stochastic policies, this allows us to deal with a more well-defined continuous objective here, right? So this objective is, is kind of continuous and oftentimes differentiable if your stochastic policy is also differentiable, right? So that allows us to use many of the rich uh, class of algorithms like based on gradients. There are also other reasons why we would favor stochastic policies, right? So in, I think, uh, uh, as also mentioned in the previous lectures, that if you have non-stationary environments, oftentimes, you know, the optimal policy may not necessarily be deterministic. Maybe the optimal policy has to be stochastic policies and you want to learn from them. You want to learn them, right? And uh, Another kind of, in practice, when you have a stochastic policy, this also encourages more exploration, right, in the real world. So, so there is a lot of good reasons why we want to learn these stochastic policies. So how do we represent or parameterize a stochastic policy, right? In the discrete action space setting, right there, many natural choices, this direct param parameterization, right? For any given state and action, right, we can assign a parameter theta to this uh, pi, right? So we, we, we assign this uh, parameter theta for any given state and action, right? So, 
So as we know that the policy has to be uh, a distribution for any given state S, hence here this theta, these parameters should sum up to one and they should be non-negative, right, when you fix any given S. Okay. Of course, this means that if your state and action are very large and then you have to deal with this um, kind of constraint, which is not oftentimes very convenient. So another alternative is use this softmax policy where you just uh, uh, parameterize your pi theta using this uh, uh, exponential normalized exponential function here. Right, as you can see here, you can just choose any arbitrary theta, right, without having to confine to any constraints. So, of course, so far, right, if your state and action space are reasonably, you know, small or like of medium size, then of course you can represent this pi theta, right, like, uh, essentially, this is also also called like a tabular setting where your state and action are, are not too large. But if your state and action space are very large, you don't really want to keep a parameter for every state and action space. So you can, we need to leverage all these function approximation techniques you have studied also yesterday, right? We can introduce some feature mappings phi and we can, instead of, uh, instead consider some linear function approximation, for example, here, theta that belongs to some low dimensional space, right, with dimension D, which is much smaller than, say, state S times action space A. And then, of course, uh, these are more computationally efficient in the sense that you don't have to deal with a very large vector anymore. But, uh, of course, the caveat here is that this policy class may not necessarily recover what is underlying ground truth or what is the true optimal policy uh, in the real problem, right? So, so your true optimal policy may not necessarily always be realizable in this case. So to take a step further, of course, we can also introduce neural networks, right? Instead of considering this uh, linear function here, we can use F theta here, which is some nonlinear neural network instead, which gives you a bit more representation power, but also introduces some additional computational challenge as well. So this is in the discrete setting. In the continuous setting, right, action, uh, if you have continuous action space, right, there are also tons of other ways that you can parameterize a stochastic policy, which is in this case, you can, you can just consider this as a continuous probability distribution. And one natural way, say for example, if your action space is just one dimensional, right, you can parameterize your policy using just a Gaussian distribution. Particularly, you're going to parameterize your, um, say, your, uh, your mean mu as uh, some function of theta, and you can parameterize your variance sigma as also some function of theta, and then you can represent your policy, say, for example, in this way. Right? Of course, you can also consider many, many other type of probability distributions as well. So once we, we, we have this parameterization, we have this objective of over our parameter space theta, right? A natural question is how does this objective look like, right? What is kind of the optimization landscape that we're talking about? So in general, this objective, right, which we denote as J pi theta, uh, in terms of theta, this is not necessarily a concave objective, right? In general, this is non-concave. And this is non-concave even in the very simplest setting where you assume, right, where you only take this direct parameterization or the softmax parameterization. So let me just uh, give you a very simple example to illustrate this, right? So you consider this MDP here in the bottom. Here you have five states, S1, S2, to S5. And there are, say, two actions, A1 and A2. A1 is to move up, A2 is to move right. And uh, there are three terminating states, S3, S4, S5, right? And uh, there is only uh, one transition where you would uh, get a non-negative reward, R, is when you transit from S2 to S4 while taking the right or the up action there, right? So if you look at this uh, uh, MDP here, and suppose there is no discount factor here, and they say discount factor R is equal to one, gamma is equal to one, right? So what is going to the value function? Right, so if you look at the value function at state S1, right, so this is going to be, basically you will only have positive reward, right, if you, if you take this path here, right, so, so value function here is going to be basically 
the probability that you will take uh, the right action at S1 times the probability that you will take the up action at S2 times the reward you will get R. Right? So you see that if you consider these as two kind of parameters, right? this is the multiplication of two parameters, and usually this is a non-concave non -concave structure. Right. To be a bit more specific, for example, you consider these two policies, pi 1 and pi 2. Right. Say pi 1 is the one that you take uh, 3 over 4 probability of taking the right action at state S1, and you take uh, also 3 over 4 probability if you're at S2 and you take action uh, of A1. Right. You can define pi 2, uh, which is sort of the opposite. Uh, and then you can look at the, uh, the average of these two policies, which is basically you take one half probabilities to take each of these actions. And then plug in these policies there, you can see that the value functions apparently does not uh, satisfy this, uh, this type of uh, Jensen's inequality, right? This is, this is, uh, does not uh, satisfy the concavity property you need, okay? So this is for the direct parameterization. For the softmax parameterization, similarly, right, you can define, say, four parameters, theta 1, theta 2, uh, theta, uh, four parameters for each of these uh, state action pairs. And then this is how your value function will look like, right, based on the softmax uh, parameterization. And again, similarly, right, you can, you can just define, say, just a simple example, theta 1, theta 2, as this uh, values, which basically corresponds to the previous policies we see in the previous example. And you can see that, again, this concavity properties basically fail to hold in this case. So that means, in general, right, we're really dealing with a non-concave objective, even under this very kind of ideal parameterization settings, right, without even involving any neural networks, right? Once we parameterize these policies, even with neural networks, then you can imagine that this problem objective will become heavily non-convex. So how do we optimize in general a, sorry, a non-concave objective, right? Over the parameter space or over your policy space. So there are, of course, uh, many algorithms uh, in the literature already from, you know, uh, many other fields that, uh, based on using, say, only zero order information of your objective, if you, if you apply, deploy your policy, you have a way to estimate your objective, then you can, you can apply many of these gradient-free methods, like uh, hill climbing, simulated linear, and so on, right? Uh, for reinforcement learning, particularly, it turns out oftentimes actually computing gradient is it's not a luxury, right? You can easily, efficiently compute the gradient, and that's why gradient-based methods are particularly very popular. And uh, this is basically our focus for this lecture. We're going to look at more closely what are the policy gradient methods and natural policy gradient methods. So in general, of course, we cannot compute the gradient exactly, right? We, we can only find some ways to roughly estimate what is the gradient. And here I denote uh, uh, hat of gradient as just some stochastic estimation of the gradient, the true gradient, based on some samples or some trajectories you have observed. And there are a number of fundamental questions we want to ask here. One is how do we construct a good estimation? And what do we mean by good, right? So good oftentimes means you want your gradient estimation to be unbiased and have relatively low variance. And uh, how does or where does this algorithm converge to, right, uh, in general, and uh, how fast do they converge to the, to the limit point? So these are also very natural questions. And then how do we improve them, right? How can we make them behave or perform much faster in practice? So before we uh, dive into the details, maybe I'll just start with a very uh, uh, a, a kind of a question here. Maybe you can also try to make a guess here. Like here are basically four algorithms. These are the uh, plots of their uh, the trajectory of these four different algorithms. And particularly here in the in the uh, in the green region here, this basically uh, describes this what is the value functions look like, right? So, so this is in, in fact what is the uh, 
the set of value functions over all feasible policies. So this is just a two like uh, a simple MDP example with only two states. And these dots are basically the trajectories of four different algorithms under different uh, initial points. So if you were to guess like which one of these behavior correspond to say policy gradient methods. Any ideas? Yes, please. Um, B, because it's following the gradient at each iteration. OK. Uh, how can you tell if this is following the gradient? Uh -huh. I don't know. Uh, it's <laughs> it's the, uh -huh. yeah, like, it got feeling. It's uh -huh. going to the vertex uh -huh. of, the, um, of the value uh -huh. landscape at each point, and maybe it's going straight to the vertex, so it's uh -huh. following the gradient exactly. Mm -hmm. Is my guess. Okay, so it's uh, following exactly the, the vertex of this uh, sort of, uh, yeah. Uh, but this is not, it's not, yeah, it's, uh, I think the observation is kind of uh, close, but this is, does not necessarily indicate it's like the, the direction of gradient, right? Uh -huh. And in fact, this is one algorithm you already have learned, I think, in one of the lectures. Uh -huh. Any other guesses? Figure A. Figure A? Wow, OK. Why is figure A? <laughs> 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 it's uh, the stochastic nature of the, uh, okay. of the function G that uh, mm -hmm. gives this smooth uh, movement from state to state. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the stochasticity, you think? Uh, so, so let me just uh, maybe. Describe again what is this red, this green region, right? This green region is basically all of your value functions v pi, s1, v pi, s2, right? For all pi that these are in your feasible set, right? So if you see these dots that's outside of your regime, meaning that uh, these values does not correspond to any feasible policy pi, okay? Uh -huh. So then uh, now <laughs> we're guessing C. Okay, C. C looks uh, promising, right? Because C, like, first of all, you see it's very slow, right? You take, like, so you see, like, the, the color code here uh, implies how many number of iterations you reach, reach to the, the end point, right? You see, like, C shows that actually this algorithm can be very sensitive to initial points, right? Depending on how your initial point is, it might converge very slowly at some point, or it might stop at some point, right? So, so this kind of uh, typical feature you would expect for gradient methods, right? For solving some like non-convex uh, objectives, right? They can be very slow, especially you don't have the true gradient, or you use, even if you have a true gradient, it can be still slow, right? And it can be very sensitive to initial points, right? So C is in fact the policy gradient, <laughs> yeah, and the. Figure A is indeed a value iteration, okay? Because the value iteration, it actually converges fast, right? But then value iteration does not guarantee at every iteration these value functions you get corresponds to any policies, right? So these are, can be infeasible, right? And B is indeed the policy iteration, right? You can see policy iteration is in fact very fast. It converges only in two iterations in this case, no matter where you start. And then the last one uh, is kind of an improved version of policy gradient, which is natural policy gradient. And this algorithm converges much faster than policy gradient, and it's a bit less sensitive to the initial points. Okay. Good. All right, so we'll kind of dive a bit into right, why would you would expect these type of behaviors. Okay. Any questions at this point? Great. So just uh, kind of recall that this is kind of the objective, right? We wanted to maximize uh, for a given policy pi theta, represented by theta, right? You can also rewrite this objective as just to say what is the expected trajectory reward 
you will get. Uh, so here I define a tau, just to align with the notations you have seen before. This is just a random trajectory, right? Which uh, is the sequence from S0, A0, S1 to, uh, to infinity, uh, to, to the end. And then this random trajectory will take place with probability or the probability that you observe, observe this uh, random trajectory tau would be basically how likely right, you observe your initial state S0 because it follows distribution mu, and how likely at state S you would take action A, how likely you transit to your next state from S A to ST plus one, right? This is the probability that this, uh, of this random trajectory tau. Okay, and the R tau is just defined as this total reward over this random trajectory, okay? So if we are going to consider what is the gradient of this objective J, right? Uh, you already seen from the day one lecture by Olivia that uh, using the log trick, right? This is going to be the gradient, right? So the gradient uh, is going to be basically your random reward times what is your, uh, this is your record score function, the gradient of log log of P theta, okay? Yeah, Olivia didn't cover this on uh, Monday. You didn't? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I checked the, the lecture slides, but okay, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> okay, so let me just uh, briefly then derive it here, right? So it's just one line of proof here. So if you look at the uh, gradient, right? So your gradient of J pi theta, Right, it's going to be basically, if you write this, is gradient of integration of R tau, right? There is probability P theta tau, right? D tau, right? So gradient over theta, right? So this is equal to integration of, right? You basically take the gradient, this is the only place where you have theta, right? P theta tau. Theta, right? Here's how you use the log trick: is that the gradient of p theta, a gradient of p theta is equal to the gradient of log p theta divided by p theta tau theta, right? Because you take the gradient of log p theta is equal to one over p theta times like by chain rule, right? The gradient of p theta over p. Sorry. Is that's the times, right? P theta tau, right? So this is uh, by the fact that if you take the gradient log P theta is one over P theta and gradient P theta, right? D tau, right? So this can be written as basic expectation that your tau is taking distribution over P theta, right? And then you have R tau gradient theta log p theta tau, okay? So this is basically your gradient. Uh, yes? How does the total reward depend on, on theta? How does the total reward depend on theta, this r tau here? Uh, the, or? Uh, expectation of the reward, that total reward, how does it depend on the parameters theta? Right, so you see that uh, this is basically a way to rewrite the total, the objective, right? So the, the dependence on theta really appears here on the probability of this uh, trajectory, right? This is where the dependence on theta come into place. Okay. Cool. Okay. So you see that the gradient of this log p theta, right? If you take the gradient of this whole thing, right? So the, this is the only place where it depends on theta, right? So if you take the log of p theta, right? You get a bunch of summation of log pi, pi theta, right? So the, the gradient is basically the summation of this. The other terms are not dependent on theta anymore, so you don't have them, right? So you only have the summation of gradient of log pi theta, so this is, this is it, right? So this basically, combining these two observations we have seen, right? This is a so-called policy gradient theorem, right? This was initially uh, introduced by Vinians in 1992, right? It's 
very simple result using the log trick, basically. Okay. So this gradient log pi theta is usually called the score function, right? And particularly, you can see that if your pi theta is differentiable, say so for example, you consider all this softmax parameterization or this Gaussian policies, right? This pi theta, you can easily compute what is the score function. Right. Just give you an example, right? If you consider this log linear policy in this uh, form here, right? Uh, if you just plug it in there, you see that the gradient of uh, your score function, basically the gradient log pi theta, basically has this very simple form, which is your feature mapping or feature vectors phi uh, minus the uh, the expectation of your feature uh, vector over A, right, your random action A, right, this is basically a, center, a centralized or a normalized uh, feature vector, okay? And based on this, you can also easily see that if you take the expectation of the score function over A, then that expectation is going to be equal to zero, right? This actually holds true not only for this simple example, right, but in general, this, uh, this is true for any policy pi theta. Right, it's also very easy to see why this is the case, and you will see like later we'll, we'll use this very often, right? So if you look at this uh, expectation over A, right, this basically gives you taking the integration over A, gradient theta log pi theta, A given S, times pi theta, A given S dA, right, by the log trick, we know that this is equal to basically log theta, pi theta uh, gradient of pi theta a given s dA, right? So this is equal to, you can exchange your gradient and the integration here. And we know that this integration over A of your policy pi, this is a distribution, this is equal to one. So taking the gradient of one, which is equal to zero. Right, so that's why you have this result. And you can see that this result can be also generalized, right? If you take anything, which we'll see later, but I'll just write it down here. If you take any function B, which is a function only in terms of state S, this is also true, right? Because you can just, uh, if you just pl plug in your BS there, you see that it does not depend on theta, it does not depend on A, Hence, right, this always gives you zero, okay. Cool. All right, so once we have this policy gradient theorem, right, you can then easily uh, derive a way to estimate what is a, a valid stochastic gradient estimator, right? So the idea is you, you have a policy pi theta, you roll it out, you get an episode, right, tau, which is the sequence Right, based on this sequence, you can then ca calculate what is your total reward over the sequence, right? What is this uh, summation of your score functions, right? This then gives you a stochastic estimation of your true policy gradient, right? This stochastic gradient estimator is also unbiased, right? Because this is just the Monte Carlo estimation, right? So it's unbiased. However, it uh, can suffer from a high variance, right? It has a high variance because there's randomness along this trajectory, right? There is also, sorry. So there is also this correlation, right, between these two terms. Both of these terms depends on the whole sequence, right? There is high correlation there as well. So, so if you're just naively using this reinforced estimator, then it could suffer from high variance. And let's see how we can maybe reduce the variance a bit, right? So one observation here is that if you look at uh, uh, these two terms, right, you can see that the uh, policies, right, say at time t2, right, these are independent with uh, everything that you have observed before this time, right? Like say it's independent essentially with all these rewards you have seen before time T2 because of this Markov property. So this means you can actually like simplify many of these terms here and get a much uh, compact form here. And that is basically the kind of another variant of policy gradient theorem, which says you can replace your uh, 
total reward by just your reward to go, this kill function. So let me just show you kind of what is, are the differences between this uh, previous expression we see and also this expression here. Right, in the previous reinforced expression, what we have is the total reward, right? This is R of tau, right? Which is the cumulative reward from uh, time zero to infinity. But now what we see in this new uh, formulation is really the cumulative reward from time t on, onwards, right? So, so the difference is really the summation from zero to t minus one. And we know that the summation and you can easily show that from the, the difference, right, which is from zero to t minus one. And these terms, are independent with pi theta of at and st, right? And so, hence, if you take the expectation, right, it's going to be the expectation of these terms times the expectation of, right, because they are independent of these terms. And we just shown that these terms are equal to zero, hence you can just remove many of these zero terms, right? So that's why you get this simplification. So in the supplementary material, you can find a more kind of detailed uh, proof here. Okay, so this is a simplified version of the policy gradient uh, theorem. And based on this, uh, Formulation, then you can you can derive another way of uh, constructing the policy gradient, right? You say at every iteration, right? You you roll out your policy pi theta, you generate this episode tau, right? You calculate what is this your reward to go function, which is an estimation, right? The Monte Carlo <coughs> estimation of your Q function at state st and at, right? You plug it in there, you get your a gradient estimator. Okay, so this. Estimator again is unbiased, right? But the again, it requires you to compute also the whole, basically the trajectory. So can we further reduce the variance? So one uh, very common way and widely used in practice is to use the baseline, right? The baseline, uh, here we, we denote a function B of, which is a function of your state S, right? You can show that your policy gradient uh, is equivalent to this form by just subtracting this function b uh, of your q function, okay? And the reason for this is exactly as what we discussed earlier, right? Is because the expectation of b, s, and gradient of log pi theta is equal to zero. Hence, you're just adding zeros to it, right? Doesn't change your policy gradient, okay? So what is a good choice of this baseline function b, s, right? So ideally, you want some function that is, or some estimation that is positively correlated with Q, right? If it's positively correlated with Q, then, right, uh, so then you can kind of reduce the variance, right? So one typical choice of this B is then to use uh, uh, the value function at state S, right? So if you use, because the value functions are kind of very similar in a way to the state action value function, right? So. So you can show that then uh, if you use the value function as the baseline, then what you have here is just your uh, Q function minus your value function, and this is called advantage function, right? The advantage function basically captures what is the advantage you would gain by taking this action A at state S rather than following your policy pi theta, right? So kind of that is the intuition here. So just to summarize, right, so there are basically different ways that you can, you can rewrite your policy gradient, right? There is the one that you use a, a reinforced expression, there is one you use just kill value functions, and then there is other one where you use advantage function or this baseline function. Okay. So, yes? Uh, Even with the positively correlated, I mean, yes. It's, uh, first of all, it's based on an intuition. Right. Uh, you can show that this reduces the variance, I think, for certain um, cases. But uh, uh, 
But this does not necessarily, say for example, right, you can always try to construct a B in a way that you can minimize, you can calculate what's the variance and you can try to construct a B that minimize the variance. Then of course that will always reduce it. But the, the, the uh, kind of the interesting question is, does this particular choice of B, right? Which right, is equal, exactly. Does yeah. this give you the minimal variance or not? I think uh, there are papers saying this gives you minimal variance, but then there are also papers disprove it. Actually, right. this is not the minimal <laughs> okay. variance estimator. But nevertheless, it's still the one that's most popularly used. Yes? Uh, can you say it one more? Is it always a bad thing? OK, so the question is, is variance always a bad thing in practice? Uh, I think if you, depends on like if you are talking about convergence, right, you want your algorithms to converge very fast, then variance is a bad thing, right, because uh, you cannot really, like, because it adds a, a bit of oscillation into your, your, your algorithm. But if you are thinking about more about, say, uh, if you want to, uh, so if you, the more variance you have, sometimes it could be a good thing because you, you can get you away from this, it can help you to avoid stuck in some local solutions, right? Because when you're stuck in some local solution, you do want to have some some variance, some noise to get out from it. So it's, I, I would say like it depends on what is the goal, yeah. Could you also say that the variance in your um, gradient estimate would sometimes in some cases for some environment help exploration? Mm -hmm. Could be, yeah, uh huh. But if the variance is too large, then maybe it's, it's, it's not going to be very helpful. But yeah, I think it's a very subtle issue, yeah, uh huh. But it's a good question, yeah. Any other questions at this point? Good. Yes. So uh, when you use the baseline as the value function, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So as, as written, I think it's the same policy, right? So would there be any benefit of using a value function of a different policy as the baseline if you had some sort of, I don't know, natural policy or something? Right, that's, that's also a very good suggestion. I think, uh, yeah, you can come up with different baselines, right? So this is to use the exact the same current policy there are benefits of using this one because you can you can directly estimate it, right? Because you are estimating Q functions anyway, right? Of course, it also makes sense if you have other available policies or other things. You can also use those as a control variable to reduce the variance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so far you see that in all these expressions, it requires you to generate the whole sequence of your, uh, your trajectory, right? And to estimate the policy gradient. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce a even, compact, even more compact form of the policy gradient representation. So you can rewrite the objective, uh, again, simplify it by just uh, introducing this uh, uh, discounted state of visitation distribution, right? So this is, basically a distribution that characterizes how likely if you start with state S, uh, how likely if you start with some initial distribution mu and following this policy pi, how likely you will visit state S, right? If you consider this uh, with some discount factor, okay? So this is basically the definition of this discounted state visitation distribution, right? So. Using this definition, you can significantly simplify what you see earlier, right? So what we see earlier is nothing but just the, the expectation of our Q functions times our score function at state S and A, right? Taking the expectation over how likely you'll visit the state S and the action A, right? That is the expectation over S following the state visitation distribution and the expectation of A following your policy pi theta. Okay. So this, this is just one line of proof by uh, invoking this definition here. Okay. So, so once we have this, you can see that uh, you can also construct a policy gradient by at every iteration, you just generate some state and action pair following this distribution and then you can just use your Q function estimation Right, you don't necessarily have to generate the whole sequence. 
But of course, how do you generate uh, a sample from the state uh, visitation distribution? Right? Uh, there are many ways you can achieve that. Uh, one way is just using this random truncation idea by generating some random horizon that follows some geometric distribution. So, right. So, so that is, I, I think uh, we will see more this type of expression are very helpful, particularly when you try to analyze the behavior of the algorithm. Okay, let me just skip this part. Okay, so just to summarize, right, we have talked about uh, how we calculate or how we estimate the policy gradient, right? So that is basically the policy gradient method, right? If you cannot uh, exactly compute the policy gradient, then you can construct some of these, all these stochastic estimations for it, right? This could be reinforced, reinforced with baseline, or more generally, uh, you can consider, uh, based on what we have seen, that the way that you estimate your policy gradient essentially requires you to estimate your Q functions, right? And we already learned tons of ways to estimate Q functions, right, from these uh, critique algorithms, like temporal difference learning algorithms. And then we can combine these uh, uh, temporal difference learning algorithms with policy gradient estimators, and that corresponds to actor critique methods. I think you will have a tutorial on actor critique methods, so I will not go into too much of details here. But say, for example, here is just an example if you are going to use just uh, the reinforced estimator, right? This is basically how policy gradient would look like, right? For any iteration, you generate an episode and then use this episode to estimate what is the total return GT, right? And then you plug it in there and you get an estimation. Or you get an update of your parameter theta. Right, if you... Alternatively, you can use the idea of temporal difference learning to, to estimate your Q-value functions, right? Particularly if your state and action is very large, then you can also introduce function approximation to it, and you can parameterize or represent your Q functions as, say, QW, right? And now you want to keep track of this parameter W in order to estimate your Q-value functions, right? So basically what you do at every iteration, right, you can calculate what is your temporal difference Right, and then based on your temporal difference, you update your W parameters, right, based on the TD learning algorithms, right. And then for your policy gradient, you're going to just leverage this Q value estimation you have, right, QW here, right, to estimate your policy gradient. And then you do a policy uh, gradient ascent step for parameter theta, right. So this is kind of the most standard version of online actor critique method. And as you can also imagine that, uh, uh, of course, there is a lot of things you need to take care of, first of all, right? How do you parameterize your Q-value functions, right? Because if you use linear function approximation on neural networks, it may not necessarily capture the true Q-value functions, right? Which means using this QW instead of the true Q-value functions would introduce some extra bias into the algorithm, right? And also, so that we, in, in general, want to use different step sizes when you update this uh, policy parameter and when you update this value parameter, right? So two time scale turns out to be very uh, crucial in practice if you want to guarantee the convergence. And uh, on top of that, there are numerous ways that you can try to build better estimators for the, you know, the Q functions or advantage function using all these concepts you have learned, like multi-step returns or the eligibility trace, right, so on and so forth, So, which I will not go into details. I'm sure you will see some of those in the tutorial this afternoon. So I want to also introduce uh, this other kind of uh, improvement or another uh, um, algorithm, which is called natural policy gradient. Uh, before that, are there any questions about policy gradient? Yes, please. Uh, it seems that uh, policy gradients do not depend on the MGP uh, dynamics, but at the same time, uh, we want to know the influence of the policy on uh, the states, so it's kind of uh, weird, isn't it? Or it's weird, uh, you're saying it does not uh, leverage these dynamics. Yeah. Uh, that's a good observation, 
right? That's what makes this different from the many of the value-based methods, right? Value-based methods really require crucially on this uh, dynamics and this Bellman equation stuff, right? Uh, so, so far, of course, the algorithm itself, you can view it basically apply to essentially any type of objective under any dynamics, as long as you are able to to, to estimate the gradient, right? But the, the way that you estimate the gradient, I think, uh, uh, like like when you try to estimate these Q functions, it still relies on kind of the dynamics, right? And also later on, you'll see that uh, these policy gradient methods are essentially can be viewed as an um, approximation of policy iteration algorithm. A policy iteration algorithm is nothing but uh, you actually choose this uh, step size to go to uh, to be very large, and that will converge basically to a policy iteration algorithm. So policy gradient methods uh, at high level, this is just an approximation of policy iteration. So this is still doing something related to the dynamics. Yeah. And uh, you also see later like uh, a lot of the convergence analysis of this algorithm, how it behaves, really heavily rely on this dynamics as well, okay? Good. So, so one of the very common used, I think, in practice, uh, uh, a policy gradient methods is called natural policy gradient, right? The, the idea was first introduced by Cacardi in 2002. Uh, so the algorithm behaves as the following, right? At every iteration, you're going to update your parameter theta, not just based on the policy gradient itself, but rather based on the natural policy gradient. And the natural policy gradient is defined as uh, you take the inverse or pseudo inverse of your official information matrix times the true gradient, right? So this is very similar to the so-called natural gradient descent algorithm. And the feature information matrix is defined based on uh, uh, your policy pi theta. You take the score function times the uh, transitive score function and taking the expectation over your state action distribution, right? So this I denote as F theta. Right, this F theta may not always be invertible, right? So that's why here, instead of using the inverse of it, I'm using just the pseudo inverse of this matrix F theta. So the high level idea of using natural policy gradient is really to leverage some of this curvature information, right? Instead of just using the pure first order information. And uh, uh, there are many benefits of using natural policy gradient, I think uh, even uh, uh, I think one of the well-known benefits is this gives you some sort of invariant properties because we know that you want to have more or less similar trajectories under different type of parameterization, policy parameterizations. You want to be able to preserve some sort of invariant properties, and this type of algorithms usually give give you those those properties. And uh, another interpretation of natural policy gradient is that you can view this as iteratively. Uh, Solving this uh, quadratic approximation of your objective, right? Our original goal is to maximize j pi theta, right? Uh, but uh, we want to make sure that at every, every iteration when we update our policy, it does not drift too far away from our previous policy, right? So that we wanted to kind of uh, uh, introduce this uh, trust region or these uh, constraints, like say, we want to make sure that when we move to the next uh, iterate, our policy is still very close to the previous policy in terms of KL divergence, right? The KL divergence between them are not too far away, okay? So in the case where we use policy gradient, basically we just to ensure that the Euclidean distance between these two parameters, theta, are not too far away from each other, right? Here we say that the policies themselves induced by this parameter, theta, should not drift too far away from each other in terms of KL divergence. Right, so you can view that basically natural policy gradient, what it does is is approximating this objective J using just the first order Taylor expansion, right? Using only first order approximation of J and using second order approximation of your KO divergence that gives you actually exactly the feature information matrix, this quadratic term, okay? So if you do that, then this gives you basically the natural policy gradient method.
So one might ask then, right, so if you look at this algorithm, right, it requires you to invert a matrix. And inverting the matrix can be very expensive, right, in the naive computation, of, a naive computation cost could be quadratic or cubic in terms of the dimension we're talking about here, right, which can be expensive. So why is this an attractive algorithm after all, right? So it turns out that uh, you, know, you can actually easily compute this uh, uh, natural policy gradient direction without having to invert this matrix F theta. You don't even have to compute this uh, inform feature information matrix F theta, right? So here's just the one simple result which says that this uh, natural policy gradient, which I def denote as w, C w star, which is just by definition, right? the inverse of your Fisher information matrix times your true gradient. So this W star is uh, the exact solution to the falling least square type problem where you try to minimize a linear function, right? W transpose your score function minus the advantage function. So if you solve this least square problem, the optimal solution of that is going to be exactly your natural policy gradient direction. And why is that the case, right? If you look at exactly this objective, which is a least square type problem, this is a convex objective, right? The minimizer, W star, should satisfy the first order optimality condition, meaning that if you take the gradient at W star, it should be equal to zero, right? If you look at the, what is the gradient of this objective here, right? So the gradient of that is going to be two times uh, this whole thing, right? W transpose this function pi theta. Times gradient log. Right, so this has to be, and you have to take the expectation, right? over S and A, I'm going to omit these distributions, this has to be equal to zero, right? So that means if you look at this, this gives you the Fisher information matrix, right? Taking expectation, right? This times this gives you actually the gradient, right? If you solve this linear equation, that basically implies W is the, exactly this form here, right? The inverse of your Fisher information matrix times the true gradient. Okay, so the implication here is basically that uh, if you wanted to implement natural policy gradient, well, what you have to do is just uh, solve this least square problem, and there are tons of ways you can solve this least square problem, right? It's a very well studied problem. You can solve it by, say, for example, stochastic gradient descent. You can solve it by conjugate gradient, many, many other methods, okay? So aside the result of this, aside the story of this uh, observation, is that uh, if you denote, say, uh, A W star as basically W star times, this is uh, basically, like you plug in the optimal W star here, right, and you define A W star as basically this linear function, okay, where the, uh, Right, as this linear function here, what you can see here is that the true gradient, right, the, the, the true gradient, policy gradient, right, just a real range of terms, right, this is going to be equal to this, right, because remember this is the inverse of F theta times the true gradient. Now I'm just uh, moving F theta on the right hand, so this is F theta times W star, right, and then if you Plug in the definition of F theta, which is the score function times the uh, transpose of score function, right? And then, then you can rearrange terms, and that's what you get here, right? So what you, what it, this says here is that your true gradient. Remember that uh, in the policy gradient theorem, what we have is that the true gradient is equal to a pi s a. Right, for a given theta pi, uh, for a given pi theta, right, so your, your 
from the policy gradient theorem that we have seen earlier, right? Your true gradient is equal to this distribution. Your score function pi theta yes, times the advantage function of your policy pi theta. Right, what this result says is that you can well just replace your advantage function by this linear function. And this linear function, the feature mappings are given exactly by your score function of pi theta. Right, so this is actually a simple result, but it's, it's quite insightful in the sense that it means when you try to estimate your advantage function, it's sufficient to just use a linear function approximation to estimate it. It does not introduce any extra bias into the picture. Right, because you just replace this advantage function by this linear function. If you use this particular feature, right, so let me just elaborate a bit more. So usually what we do is we approximate this, right, by some linear function approximation or nonlinear function approximation with some, you know, prefixed feature vectors phi, right? This result says that if you choose particular this feature vectors phi as nothing but just gradient of your log pi theta, right, this will exactly recover the true policy gradient with, without introducing any bias into the picture. So that's why in practice, right, if you run actor critique methods, right, if you use this particular linear function approximation, it's sufficient enough for getting an unbiased gradient estimator. Okay. Are there any questions at this point? Yes? Um, so did we estimate, sorry, uh, did we put the uh, objective gradient with the form of the, sorry, um, mm -hmm. did we put the objective gradient in the form of the state visitation frequency distribution just to get it in the form of the Fisher matrix so that we could do all of this stuff? Uh, <laughs> I think it's more like a convenience thing for mass, uh, right, yes. Okay. That's, that's, yeah. So uh -huh. it's convenience, but uh, okay, but it's not some uh, special like mathematical thing that I'm missing, right? Mm. No, I think, uh, yeah, it's more just uh, to be more convenient to see all these connections, right? But also, you can also use that as a way to construct different gradient estimations. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and of course, like, uh, so far, this is just the, the case where assume that you uh, can exactly One question, please. Yes, sure. uh, you said now we are linear, but in mm -hmm. uh, with respect to W, W star, mm -hmm. I don't see the connection between W star and theta. And theta. Yeah. There is no, you don't need to have any connection between them, right? This W is the parameter you use to estimate your value functions. Theta is the parameter you use to parameterize your policies. Right, so the W is really something that you use only to estimate your value functions. And once you have the value functions, you use it, plug it into the policy gradient theorem, right? You use it to construct a policy gradient. Okay. So these are two separate parameters that oh. you keep track of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I see, I see now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. All right. Yes. So does using the Fisher information in the objective actually have an impact on the variance? Like as an, it's unbiased as you mm -hmm. showed, mm -hmm. but does it have an impact on the variance as opposed to using something else? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Uh, so it's harder to exactly characterize uh, the comparison between the variance of these two estimators. Because uh, in practice, what you would do, right, where does the variance come from? It really comes from how you estimate or how you solve this W, right, W star, right? And the, the variance usually comes from how you solve this problem here. You're going to use samples that you generate from this policy pi theta and use those samples to estimate what is W star, right? So in a way that uh, this gives you an easier control of the variance because uh, 
the more samples you use to solve this problem, right, you can get a more accurate solution of W star, and you can actually make sure that the, uh, in the end, the W star or the approximate solution you get for W star does not have too much variance. Right, so, so here, I think, uh, with natural policy gradient, it sort of separates this variance and the bias issue. But in the, in the policy gradient, if you directly use the samples to estimate it, you would have this, this variance. But here, I think, uh, in the way that uh, uh, all what you care about is the accuracy of how you, you, you compute this policy gradient or how you solve this W star, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, there is another question, yeah? Uh, so policy gradient methods are usually used for continuous action spaces. So the mapping phi of S A, uh, how can you create, uh, so the W vector that you would need to create like your unbiased estimator, in this case it would be infinite dimensional? Uh, no, it does not have to be infinite dimensional, right? Because uh, this this is just a vector from say RD, right? For any state and action, right? You can construct construct some feature maps that slides in say dimension RD, right? W is also in dimension RD, right? Does not have to be infinite. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right. Maybe I skip this part. Okay, let's see. So, so in the end, I, I wanted to uh, maybe shed light a bit about uh, the convergence guarantees you would expect with policy gradient, natural policy gradient, particularly. I mean, the interesting questions that uh, a lot of researchers have spent many time in the past few years is to understand, you know, can policy gradient methods or when does policy gradient methods convert to a globally optimal solution? Because right, we mentioned that, uh, after all, you're solving a non-concave objective. And we know that if you run gradient ascent to solve a non-concave objective, at the best, you would hope to get a convergence to some stationary point or critical points. Right? So, but when does this algorithms guarantee convergence to the true globally optimal solution? Because we know that the critical points has no quality, in short, like, has no, poli uh, no quality guarantees on, right? Critical points could be subtle points, right? Could be local, local mean, could be local max, right? They do not give you any quality uh, insurance, right? And also, uh, critical point is when the gradient is very small, and for various reasons, you might have vanishing gradients, right? And that does not necessarily mean that you converge to a reasonably good policy. So we want to understand are there any good global optimality guarantees for policy gradient methods. And the other question is really trying to understand why does policy, natural policy gradient method perform better than policy gradient method? And what are the differences in their sample efficiencies or uh, computation efficiencies? So I want to give you, again, this toy example we have seen also a bit earlier, but a different one, where you have these two states and two actions. And uh, here is uh, a visualization of what is a value function look like at, uh, say, one of the state under different parameterizations, under, say, direct parameterization. So, so your x and y axis are theta 1, theta 2, and your y axis is a value function under these different uh, parameters, theta 1, theta 2. And you can clearly see that it has this non-concave non shape. And if you run policy gradient methods to solve it, and the observation you can see for this particular example is that no matter where you initialize your policy gradient, even if you use the same step size, they will always converge to the optimal uh, policy, basically. Okay? And you can also show, see that for this example that the larger step size you use, right, from left to right, you see that uh, I'm uh, increasing my step size from 0.01 to 0.05, 0 0.1 uh, to 1, right? The larger step size, it looks like this algorithm converts faster, 
right, to the global optimal policy, right? And, uh, and this is uh, not just one uh, single observation, right? Actually, you can observe this even for many of the practical applications, although the problem is non-concave. So question one is, when does policy gradient methods convert to the global optimal policy and why, right? What are the intuition here? I think uh, kind of one of the optimization wisdom here, at least that was uh, uh, discovered in the past few years, is that uh, if you consider gradient descent or even stochastic gradient descent, right, these algorithms convert to global optimal for problems with very benign non-convex uh, landscape. Right. So if your objective is kind of, is not convex, but it's convex-like, right, in the sense that, uh, for example, if you satisfy this type of gradient dominance property, where the difference of your function values from any given policy pi to the optimum policy pi star is bounded by the gradients, then you can see that in this case, if the gradient is small, then that means that you are close to the optimum policy. P, P is just some order, like could be in between one to two or any other, right? So the idea here is if your objectives are dominated by the gradient, right, then you can say that if the gradient is more, or if the gradient is close to zero, or if there are other critical points, then you are also at a global optimal points, right? So it's sufficient to find the critical points. So why does natural policy gradient perform better than policy gradient? Again, there has been a lot of theoretical study trying to understand what are the convergence guarantees for natural policy gradient, and kind of one one explanation or one observation is that natural policy gradient, uh, if you perform natural policy gradient on the parameter space, this is equivalent to performing something called policy mirror descent on the policy space. Right? And then policy mirror descent uh, is known to be able to get uh, convergence guarantees that are dimension free. And, uh, and we'll discuss some of the results here uh, in the remaining few minutes. So to give you a sense of what is the policy gradient, or, um, like the gradient dominance property, I think it's important to introduce this super important lemma. It's called a lemma, but I think this is maybe one of the most important results in theory of reinforcement learning, is a so-called performance difference lemma. Right, this lemma basically characterizes the um, difference between two policies, pi and pi prime, right? If you look at the, the difference between two policies, pi and pi prime, this difference is exactly, can be written as what is the expectation of the advantage function over the state action visitation distributions, right? The, the kind of the intuition here is that the difference between their objective is basically what is the advantage that I will take at state S a different policy pi from my pi prime. Right. So this basically characterizes what is the advantage that at state S I'm going to take an action from policy pi instead of policy pi prime. Okay. And uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, the so-called performance difference lemma. Okay. And I say this. This result is important because you can actually use this result to derive many, many other theorems or results you have seen in reinforcement learning. For example, you can easily use this result with only one line of proof to show that the, uh, to prove the policy improvement theorem for policy iteration, and you can use this to show linear convergence of policy iteration algorithm. And you can also use this to show policy gradient theorem as well. You can use this to prove many things. And the proof of this uh, lemma is actually quite simple. Maybe I will just show you here, uh, since we have still a bit of time. So if you look at the difference between these two value functions, v pi minus v pi prime, right? Uh, by definition, v pi, right? This is a cumulative reward you get. Let me just uh, add and subtract this v pi prime for every state s, right? I'm just adding and subtracting something so this does not change my value here. 
And I can simplify this, as you can see that uh, uh, this is taking summation from zero to infinity and when t is equal to zero, uh, that's where my state S0 starts from, state S. So there is one term that can cancel with this V pi prime, which is the first term, right? So I can actually rewrite this in the following form, right? I can, I can, so this, this term is here still the same, right? This term, because I don't have the first uh, uh, term at t equal to zero anymore, I can only count uh, the summation from t from one to infinity, and I'm going to shift the index a bit from zero to infinity, that's why I'm, uh, shift the index by plusing one here. Okay, so these two are equivalent. Okay, and then if you use a tar property and it was shown that the first term here, right, if you just take the expectation over S T plus one, this gives you exactly the Q value functions. Right, so, so now you see that this is the difference between Q value functions and your value functions at policy pi prime, and this is the advantage function which gives you the performance difference lemma. And now with this performance difference lemma, right, you just rewrite it a bit, you see that uh, this basically characterizes the difference between any given policy pi and the optimum policy pi star can be written as this form, right? This is how likely you will visit state S and uh, action A if you follow policy pi star and what is the advantage if you take some action that's not, uh, that deviate from policy pi. And if you recall what is the policy gradient theorem we discussed earlier, here's just a simplification in the tabular setting. If we consider direct parameterization or softmax parameterization, you can exactly write down what is the policy gradient. And the policy gradient is going to have some form like this, right? Is a, is a uh, discounted distribution D times your Q value functions in the direct parameterization case. And in the softmax parameterization, it has this form here. Again, there is nothing tricky here. You just uh, plug in the theorems uh, with this particular policy parameterization. This is what you will get. And if you compare these two results on the performance difference lemma and the policy gradient theorem, right, you see that they have a lot of terms in common. Right? There was the state distribution, policy pi, here is pi star. Right? There is a pi here, which is a dominant in term. They are the same. Right? This basically suggests this type of inequality hold that Right, if your gradient is small, that means these terms are going to be very small, and that means your objective difference will be very small. Yes? When you say convex light, mm -hmm. do, you mean, do you mean like this or like this? <laughs> right. Like that or like that? Uh, convex light, I should be more precise because we're always maximizing the reward, so it really be, should be concave like, right? It should really be something like this, right? Because Concave like, yes, sorry, uh-huh. Right, so it could be, right, we know that convex, concave has to be something like this, right, but if you have some shape like this, this is not necessarily concave, but it's concave like, for example. Or, right, so these are all concave. This is concave, right, this is also concave, but this is not concave, but it's concave like, for example. Right, and for this type of objectives, you can see although it is non it's not concave, but at these points, uh, maybe it's not the best uh, example here, but uh, yeah, at these local points, it's also globally optimal, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, so in slide uh, 38, mm -hmm. uh, in slide 38, um, uh, you said that using larger uh, step okay. size converges fast to the optimal value, but uh -huh. uh, this is a very simple case. So, for example, for more complex settings, mm -hmm. um, we will have this problem of stability. Mm -hmm. So, right. um, how do you uh, tackle this problem? Mm -hmm. Do you use a, a regulator between uh, um, different policies and do you take the mm -hmm. expectation over different states or mm -hmm. um, there is another... Uh, method to tackle this mm -hmm. problem. Right, uh, as you see the step size is actually very important, right, for policy gradient methods, right, the whole performance of policy gradient method essentially depends on really the 
the variance of your gradient estimator and the, the, the choice of your step size. So here, that result I shown you is when there is no variance, right? The, you can exactly compute the gradient. And then that's where you, you can see that the larger step size you use, the better. Because the larger step size you use, the more closer you are to policy iteration. And we know that policy iteration converges in a few iterations, right? So that is kind of uh, that behavior there. But of course, in practice, oftentimes you have variance in your policy gradient, right? You can only estimate it, right? You cannot really use too large step size. Otherwise, it will introduce a lot of instability into the algorithm behavior. And you have to, as you said, introduce some regularization techniques. I will discuss a bit uh, in a moment, yes? But uh, let me just, uh, sorry, get back to uh, sort of this high level idea here is that uh, because we can show this type of gradient dominance property and then that guarantees at high level that the policy gradient matters, although they're dealing with a non-concave objective, they're able to converge to a globally optimal solution. And uh, particularly, for example, this is a recent result that was shown that if you consider the tabular policy gradient method and use a constant step size and assume that you can exactly compute your gradient and you do this projected gradient descent update because your policy has to satisfy this uh, simplex uh, type of constraints. And then you can show that uh, policy gradient methods can converge to a globally optimal policy. Uh, in the convergence rate of one over square two t here, if you use a constant step size, and this result has been, you know, improved extensively in the past two years. Actually, one can show that if you use larger step size, or if you do line search, then you can actually prove linear convergence for policy gradient method. However, the caveat is that these methods usually suffer from this very large constants, right? That depends on state action space, depends on this distribution mismatch coefficient, which can be very large, okay? And it also depends on this large, you know, effective dependence on the effective horizon. On the other hand, as I mentioned, natural policy gradient method can be viewed as a performing a mirror descent on the policy space. And this is a case where you use softmax parameterization in the tabular setting. And I just uh, briefly show the result without uh, going too much of the details here. You can find all the proof analysis in the supplementary material after the slide. Here you can show that if you use a constant step size, then natural policy gradient method actually converges much faster than policy gradient method, right? In this case, it converges one over T rate without any dependence on this state action or this distribution mismatch coefficient as you see earlier, right? It has a very clean convergence guarantee here. And also you can, you, can, you can show these results can be further improved. In some cases, you can even expect some quadratic convergence rather than linear convergence locally. So I still have a few minutes, right? I wanted to maybe touch point to, to this uh, issue that was mentioned earlier, right? How do we deal with step size? So as I said, step size is perhaps one of the most uh, important challenge. One of the biggest challenges with policy gradient methods in practice is that uh, these methods can be very sensitive to how you choose step size. If the step size is too large, you can imagine that you might just uh, get a very terrible policy at the next iterate. And then that policy will induce even worse data, right? which is not going to be helpful. If the step size is too small, then you end up with a very similar policy and your data is more or less similar, right? This will, does not help with efficient exploration. So sort of the common remedy of uh, dealing with the step size is you can, you can do line search or you can introduce this trust region type of regularization to ensure that your, your, your policy does not drift too far away from the previous iterates, or there are also ideas like clipping that was extensively used in, say, proximal point policy optimization algorithms. And then there are, also, of course, many other challenges, like how can you efficiently leverage your data from the previous uh, policies, right? This is kind of the big difference from policy gradient methods to stochastic gradient descent for training supervised learning tasks. Because in supervised learning tasks, Right, you, you can uh, always uh, reuse your data, right? You can, you can, because those data are oftentimes IID, right? You can reuse them and you can, you can 
runs the classic gradient descent more efficiently. But here, the data generated from different policies can be different, right? So it's, it's hard to directly reuse them, right? You need to use a lot of additional techniques like important sampling or experience replay in order to reuse your data efficiently and to improve sample efficiency. And we mentioned about uh, you know, the high variance of stochastic gradient estimators and the remedies to combine with this temporal difference learning algorithm, which are known to have low variance to, to, to fix it. And as I said, you probably see more in the tutorial this afternoon. And uh, one of the, uh, as I said, to, to, to deal with the fact that the step size is too sensitive is to consider this uh, trust region ideas, right? This is called trust region policy optimization. So the idea here is that you want to approximate your objective using this uh, objective here, sub such that your next iterate is, does not drift too far from your previous iterate in terms of the KO divergence, okay? And this algorithm is called TRPO, and uh, you can view this uh, essentially as uh, 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 approximating your original objective with this linear approximation by replacing your policy pi here by pi by kind of fixing your uh, your your expectation here following the state uh, action visitation distribution of your previous iterate pi actually no right. actually yeah sorry so this is so remember that uh, from the uh, uh, performance difference lemma, right? So you can basically rewrite j pi as j pi t times uh, plus this whole thing here, right? So what you can do now is basically this, we don't know how to estimate it, right? So we don't know how to optimize it. You basically replace this by d mu pi theta, and then you you consider this uh, surrogate objective and then you solve it. So this is sort of the main idea of TRPO. And this has been, of course, one of the most popularly used benchmark in among all policy gradient methods. And then there is also the proximal policy optimization, which again, we probably have heard this in many, many places, right? The idea again is to, uh, to, to introduce this clipped objective so that you do not have to deal with these constraints in the previous, in TRPO, and you don't have to deal with this uh, step size choice. Uh, in, uh, and this algorithm is much more robust to different uh, step size, and you can, you can just solve this single objective here. So the idea is just you wanted to make sure that your next iterate does not drift too far away from your previous iterate, so you introduce this clipped objective to ensure that uh, you would penalize uh, the objective if your uh, ratio between these two uh, policies are very large, okay? And then you solve this iterative based on stochastic gradient descent methods. This is called PPO. And this, uh, as some of you know, this is one of the workhorse for also ChatGPT as well and has shown a lot of uh, tremendous numerical uh, success in practice. So I think I, it's about time to, to kind of wrap up. And uh, uh, here's just one uh, kind of summary I would like to borrow from Shorman's slide. And as you can see that there is a lot of uh, modification when you move from just the pure vanilla policy gradient methods to this more kind of more than you know, uh, advanced uh, policy optimization algorithms like TRPO and PPO. And for policy gradient methods and natural policy gradient, we have relatively good theoretical understanding of how these algorithms perform, right? What are their convergence guarantees? How can you integrate them with function approximation, with the cast gradient estimation, with sample-based approaches, and how do you analyze their sample efficiency, right? However, there are, of course, in practice, people oftentimes use these more you know, heuristic uh, approaches like TRPO or PPO, which has less theoretical understanding but shows much better performance, right? So obviously, there is a big gap between the theory and the practice, and I would say there are 
a lot of room to, uh, to work on in this domain on policy gradient methods. And if you are interested in any of these topics, uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards. With that, I'll just uh, conclude here. And thank you very much for staying with me. Thank you. Thank you very much.